Let me invite your attention to Matthew chapter 14. And while you're turning there, I want to remind you again of the prayer gathering this evening at the Bryant High School Stadium. If you have been to one of these gatherings before, this one will be completely different. There will be no speakers. There will be one facilitator, and we're going to pray. That's what we're there to do, so we're going to pray. And I need you there. Some of you who are watching online that don't have uh, health issues that can get out, I hope you will join us as well. It will be at 6 o'clock. Uh, we'll be warm. You may want to bring a bottle of water or something like that just to be sure you don't get uh, overheated. But I sure hope to see you there this evening at the stadium at Bryant High School. Well, this summer we've been uh, looking at encounters uh, with Jesus, looking at the lives of some of those he touched, and then learning more about him and more about how we should uh, respond to him in our own relationship with him. And this morning is going to be the final encounter here in Matthew 14, verses 22 through 33. I want us to look at this passage from, from two different angles or two different focuses. First of all, we're going to look at this passage um, and focusing on our Lord. What does this encounter tell us about him? And if you're here this morning and you're in uh, a difficult time, I think what we learned this morning will be a great encouragement to you. And then secondly, we'll kind of shift focus or put the camera on the disciples and specifically on Peter as we examine our own faith and our own responsiveness to the calling of the Lord. Well, let's start in uh, Matthew 14. Let's start with verses 22 through 24. It says, immediately he made the disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side. That's the other side of the Sea of Galilee. While he dismissed the crowds. After he had dismissed the crowds, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone. But the boat by this time was a long way from the land, beaten by the waves, for the wind was against them. Now, if you look at the section immediately preceding what we just read in verse 22, you'll see that Jesus had just fed the 5,000, actually closer to 25 or 30,000 when you added women and children. That's enough people to completely fill this room over 15 times. 25 to 30,000 people he'd fed. Now, after such a high moment as you can imagine that was, why would Jesus be in such a hurry to depart? Well, Jesus' ministry had been growing, it had been gaining in popularity for two years. Uh, people had uh, been healed, demons had been cast out, people had seen that, people had heard that. Jesus taught with authority like they had never seen before. And now, he fed them, all of them, with his bare hands. Well, in John's account of this miraculous feeding, which is found in the sixth chapter of the Gospel of John, John tells us that the people got together. His ministry had been growing and building, and now this happens. They got together, and they determined that they were going to make him king, and they would do it by force if necessary. If he wasn't willing, they would do whatever it took to make him king. Why? Because they wanted a king who would lead a revolt against the Romans and overthrow or throw off that Roman oppression. They wanted a king who could heal them and feed them and, and make life easier for them. In fact, in John's account, he tells us that the next morning, the crowd showed up on the other side of the Sea of Galilee. After he'd fed them, they all just found places to sleep out in the, uh, in the countryside. They got up the next morning. He wasn't there. The boat that had been there, they knew was gone. So they went to the other side of the Sea of Galilee looking for Jesus. But Jesus knew why they were looking for them. He knew their heart, and so he confronted them. And Jesus basically said to them, you didn't come find me because you're concerned about the kingdom of God. You just wanted another meal. So here's the only meal that you're going to get from me. You'll have to eat my flesh and drink my blood. What? Now, at this point, many of those who had been following Jesus, not, not the 12, not the disciples that were close, but many of that crowd began to fall away. This is a turning point in his ministry. What was Jesus saying? Jesus was saying, when he said, you have to eat my flesh and drink my blood, Jesus was saying, you have to take me on my terms. You have to take all of me. I have to be not just your Savior, but your Lord and your Master. And we need to remember that we accept Jesus on his terms, not our terms. And let's be honest, sometimes we're just like these people. We want a Messiah who can do for us. We want a Messiah who can make our lives comfortable, a Messiah who can fill our dreams for a good life. And I remember all of my years growing up, and even in young adulthood, one of the uh, lines most often used in evangelism was, God has a wonderful plan for your life. Is that true? Absolutely. But it depends on how you define the word wonderful. God's wonderful plan includes him fulfilling his, his plans and his purpose in your life, but that doesn't mean it'll be an easy life. 
If you think wonderful means a life of ease and a life of pleasure, you don't understand. Now, there's going to be a wonderful life in your next life when you get to heaven. But in this life and in this world, there's going to be pain and suffering and hardship. Jesus was telling these people, if you're going to come after me, it's complete surrender. It's complete surrender to him and to his plan and to his purpose. He's called Lord for a reason. Quite honestly, the disciples really didn't get it either, even though they'd been with him all this time. They, they saw Jesus gaining in popularity. They saw this surge of people coming to, to sweep Jesus in his king. They probably got pretty excited. They probably felt like, hey, we have accomplished something significant, life-changing. We've worked with him these two years to get things to this point. Now, remember, the disciples thought they were going to have key positions in this kingdom, that they were going to be leaders. But then here's this pinnacle moment after the feeding of the 5,000. It seemed like the hardship of the last two years, all that they had gone through is about to pay off. And Jesus sends the disciples away. He puts them in a boat, tells them to go to the other side of the sea, and then he dismisses the crowd, and you see the word immediately. After he has dismissed the crowd, the scriptures tell us that Jesus goes by himself or alone up on the mountain to pray. Now, that's not unusual. Jesus spent a lot of time alone with the Father. He spent time uh, before big decisions like the calling of the Twelve. He withdrew and spent time with the Father. When there was uh, a lot of pressure and demands of ministry, he would withdraw and spend time with the Father and, and get refocused. Now, we don't know, the, the Scripture doesn't tell us what Jesus was discussing with the Father on the mountain, but I think he may have been praying about this temptation to bring the kingdom in a different way. You remember that when Satan tempted Jesus after his time in the wilderness, Satan offered him all the kingdoms of the world if he would simply bow down to him. Jesus had the same struggle in the garden just before he went to the cross. He asked, Father, is there any other way? Can the accomplishment of bringing your kingdom come in any other way? And now these people are pressing and they're clamoring for him to be their king. And so what does Jesus do? He sends the crowd away and he goes and he spends time with the Father. There is both encouragement and instruction in that. I thought of Hebrews 4.15 where we're told we have a great high priest who is tempted in every way as we are yet without sin. There's encouragement in knowing that even our Lord was tempted and instruction in knowing that the way that he overcame that temptation was he spent time in prayer. You know, it's always tempting for us to, to do things our own way, the easy way, the, the way of less uh, resistance. Jesus, when that temptation came, prayed for strength. Now, obviously, I think we can infer that another thing Jesus was talking to the Father about was the disciples. The disciples are in a storm, both physically and spiritually. They still didn't fully understand who Jesus was and what the kingdom of God was about. And they're in the midst of a physical storm. And what is Jesus doing? He, he's praying for them. You may remember a few weeks ago, Pastor Jason covered the other uh, storm experience the disciples had when they were in a boat. Jesus was in the boat with them, asleep in the boat, and the storm came up. And all they had to do was wake him up. And then in his divine authority, he calmed the wind and the waves. But this time, they're out there alone. They're left to their own devices. No, no, they're not. The disciples were not alone in the storm. He may not, Jesus may not have been physically present, but he is praying for them. They may not know it, but they are secure and they are protected. And I say that to remind us that when there are storms that we go through where we feel alone, when there are storms we go through that we feel like Jesus has abandoned us, we need to remember if we're his child, even when we don't sense his presence, he's there with us. Hebrews chapter 7, verse 25 says this about the ministry of Jesus. He lives, today he lives, the right hand of the Father. He lives to do what? To intercede for us. He's our intercessor, and certainly when we're in the storm, he is interceding for us. Verse 25. In the fourth watch of the night, he came to them walking on the sea. But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified, and they cried out, It is a ghost. And they cried out in fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them, saying, Take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. The fourth watch of the night, that's between 3 and 6 a.m. They divided the night into watches, starting at 6 p.m. 6 to 9 is 1. 9 to 12 is 2. 
2, 12 to 3 is 3, and 3 to 6 is 4. So it's between 3 and 6 a.m. We don't know exactly what time the disciples left after the feeding. We do know as soon as Jesus fed the multitude, he sent the disciples away. So let's say it was probably somewhere between 6 and 8 p.m. Verse 24 told us the boat was a long way from land, beaten by the waves, for the wind was against them. So they've been in this storm for about 8 to 10 hours. It's now the darkest part of the night between 3 and 6 a.m., and they're hopeless. Why did Jesus wait so long? All night they've been anxious, they've been in fear for their lives, and he waited. Well, that, that waiting is a lesson for them and for us, and that is this. If you've never been in a storm that took you to your limit, if you've never been in a storm that, that strung you out to the max, you have probably never experienced the power of God at work in your life. That's where we see his power in the midst of the storm. And until you encounter a storm you can't handle, you will never know that he can handle it. We always try to figure it out on our own, don't we? We always try to find the solution. We always try to find the the way out until we get to the point where we're taken to the limit and and we're stressed to the max. We won't know that he can handle it. Jesus knew their situation as he was up on that mountain praying. He knew it before he came to them. He knew it when he was on the mountain. He, He could have stopped the storm from the mountain. He could have kept the storm from ever developing. But see, the storm was in God's plan and purpose. Sometimes the storm in our lives is part of God's plan and God's purpose. The disciples came to the point where they recognized their limit. There was nothing they could do to get themselves out of this situation, out of this storm. And so, at that point, Jesus came to them. And even in the darkest part of the night, he knew exactly where they were, and he came to them. Listen, even in the midst of the storm and the suffering, you see that God lovingly protects his people. And some of us here today really need to hang on to that truth. It's never so dark that he doesn't know where you are. There's no storm so extreme that it's out of his control. He will come. And Jesus never comes too late. Mark it down. You may think I'm about to go under. Listen, Jesus knows, and he never comes too late. For the, for the true believer, for the Christ follower, there is no fear because he will come. Now, for sure in this life, we're going to have difficulty. We're going to have storms. Jesus told us that in John 16. In this world, you will have trouble. Some of us will have more storms. Some of us will have storms of, of greater degree or, or greater uh, intensity, but all of us are going to suffer in this life to varying degrees. And what we need to remember is we're never away from the divine authority that controls the storm. Jesus clearly demonstrated that he has divine authority over even uh, nature, even storms. We're also never away from the divine knowledge of the one who knows us, who knows our needs, who knows our circumstances, who knows exactly where we are in the storm. And we're never away from the protective care of the one who saved us. Well, let's quickly change angles now, or change cameras to focus on the boat and the disciples, specifically Peter. What does this passage teach us about our faith and our response to the faithful one? Look with me in verse 28. And Peter answered him, Lord, if it's you, command me to come to you on the water. He said, come. So Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water and came to Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid, and beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Jesus immediately reached out his hand, took hold of him, saying to him, Oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased, and those in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. Peter experienced the powerful presence of Jesus because he was willing to take a leap of faith, to get out of the boat, the only place of safety at that point, to get out of the boat in in the midst of the storm. And when I think about those who are in the boat, you know, I think the rest of the disciples symbolize most of us as believers. Play it safe. Make sure we stay in a place where we're secure. We say we believe in the power of God. We say we believe that he can do the miraculous, even the impossible but we're not sure he can do it through us. And we don't want to get out of the safety of the boat. 
Now let's think about those disciples for just a minute. They've been with Jesus about two years. You know, the Gospels, um, some of them have accounts of the same event. Some of them have accounts that other Gospels don't. But if you take just the Gospel of Matthew and just look at what Matthew describes they've been through in two years, it, it's astonishing. In chapter 4, it says that Jesus was healing every disease and sickness of many people, probably hundreds. He was healing the paralyzed. He was healing or casting out demons. In chapter 8, he healed one with leprosy. He, raised the centur- he healed the centurion's servant. He healed Peter's mother-in-law. After that happened, many people flooded to that house, and he healed many, many people of their physical diseases and of demon possession. He calmed the storm, the other storm that the disciples were in with him. Healed two demon-possessed men. Chapter 9, he heals a paralytic. He raises a dead girl. He heals a sick woman. He heals two blind men. He heals a demon-possessed mute man. Chapter 12, he heals a demon-possessed man who's blind and mute. And then chapter 14, the feeding of the 5,000. They've seen literally hundreds of miracles occur before their very eyes. Why are they so frightened? Why did they lack faith? Seeing and hearing is not believing. Seeing and hearing is not believing. Seeing the account that we've been given in the Scripture and hearing the account we've been given in Scripture, even reading the accounts of Scripture all the time doesn't mean that you believe. Believe is is active. It's not passive. You believe with your body. Get out of the boat. Well, here's Peter. He's impetuous. He's brash. He's rash. So, of course, he's the one. But do you notice what Peter doesn't say? When Jesus reveals to the disciples that it's him, I I don't know about you, but I think my first response would have been, Lord, if it's you, calm the storm. Because they'd seen him do that before. They knew he could. Peter doesn't say, Lord, if it's you, calm the storm. He says, Lord, if it's you, I want to be with you. I want to be where you are. Because when you're with Jesus in a storm, you're in the safest place you could possibly be. Peter was more concerned about getting out of that boat and getting to Jesus. And the boat was safe, as far as they knew. He's willing to give up that safety just to be with Jesus. He didn't say, calm the storm. He said, I want to be where you are. And Jesus' reply is very simple. It's just one word. Come. And can I tell you that Jesus still today says to his children, come. Jesus says, come. Now, getting out of the boat and taking a leap of faith is not easy. You have to leave everything behind. That may be a friendship, maybe a relationship, maybe stuff, maybe dreams and ambitions and plans. But you have to let go of anything that is keeping you from walking with Jesus, anything that is keeping you from experience his presence and power in your life. Now, you got to wonder, what, what was Peter thinking when he's swinging his legs over the side? Maybe he was thinking, I'm, I'm getting in over my head. Yeah. Maybe he was thinking, boy, I could really look foolish doing this. Yeah. Maybe he was even thinking, you know, I could get hurt or, or, or I could die out here. Yes. Following Jesus requires being willing to even give up our very life. That's why Jesus told them in Luke 9 and verse 23, if anyone would come after me, let him what? Deny himself, take up his cross daily, be willing to die daily, and follow me. Now we look at Peter and we want to point out, well, well, yeah, his, his faith wavered. Jesus even said, why do you have little faith? But, but he did have faith. He stepped out in faith. What happened was he began to put his eyes on his circumstances and he began to sink. And that tells us when we're walking in faith and walking with Jesus, we have to keep our eyes on Jesus. You can't look back to the safety of the boat. You can't look back at friends who are shrinking back in faith. You have to look to Jesus. Keep your eyes on Jesus. Peter was never the same. This was a major turning point in his life. He experienced the presence and the power of Jesus. He knew in that moment 
Jesus was not like any earthly king or authority. Peter knew he was the Christ, the son of the living God. In fact, if you go two chapters later in Matthew, in verse, uh, chapter 16 of Matthew, Jesus and the disciples were at a place called Caesarea Philippi. At Caesarea Philippi, there is all kinds of worship of false gods. There's this uh, mountainside that has all these caves in it, and a different god lives in every cave, and sacrifices are made, and these gods are worshiped. And in that setting, as they're looking at that, Jesus asked the disciples, who do men say that I am? And, and one said, well, some say you're Elijah, or one said, you're, you're one of the prophets. What did, what did Peter say? You are the Christ, the son of the living God. He got it. After the first storm experience the disciples had, when Jesus calmed that storm, the disciples asked themselves, who is this that even the winds and sea obey him? They asked a question. After this storm, there's no question, there's a declaration. Look again at verse 33 at their response. And those in the boat worshipped him saying, truly you are the son of God. Finally, they're recognizing Jesus for who he is, and as a result, they worship him. I'm not sure when we come to worship that we're in full recognition and cognizant of who Jesus is. I think we forget that. They recognize who he is, and they, and they worship him. And this is a, a pivotal point, a definitive turning point for these disciples. Life is never going to be the same from this point. And this morning, we need to ask the question, what, what about us? What about you? Have you come to the place where you have confidence that Jesus, the one you call Savior, is the Son of the living God? If you believe that, it should change the way that you walk by faith. And maybe you're here this morning and you just needed the reminder that you can rest and you can have faith in his divine authority over every storm. You can rest and you can have faith in his divine knowledge of knowing where you are in the storm. And you can rest and have faith in his divine protective care that will see you through the storm. And for all of us here this morning, whether you're in a storm or, or not at this point, we have to ask the question, am I willing to listen to his call? When, when he says, come, when he calls me out, am I willing to not play it safe but to take a step or a leap of faith and to get out of the safety and security of the boat and walk with Jesus.